can see your pointer, sorry. Okay, perfect. So yeah, thank you so much for the introduction again, Pratyasha, and a big shout out to the IEEE DEIA student branch, firstly, from IIT Kanpur India for arranging this wonderful session. I think it's really nice that we get to interact and discuss about the state of the art right now. So for today's webinar, my primary topic would be the SF6 alternative no, uh, novel gas mixtures, and I'll uh, focus more on the industry applications and a slight of physics behind it. So I'll not bother with a lot of equations and everything, but more about the uh, graphs and the direct interpretation of them. So, yeah. Since my introduction is already given, I just will say like in 10 seconds maybe. So I come from a wonderful place called West Bengal in India. So if you haven't visited it, do visit it. It's wonderful, I can tell you. And I love biking, traveling, gardening, and snow sports as well. The rest of it, as she has already said, I worked uh, as asset management engineer at Tenet and then at ETH Zurich, especially on the gaseous insulation group. And right now I'm working as the HP Network Components Product Development Manager at Prismium for North Europe. So I'm especially in the ClickFit division where we develop products like uh, connectors, then terminations, joints, link boxes, new patented products, and anything you name it for cable accessories from 72 to 550 kV, we have it. So. Yeah, and in case if you're interested to discuss more about my work or research or about anything else, like I'm open for it in LinkedIn. So maybe I'll forward the slides in the end and then yeah, we can come. So coming to the topic today for the SF6 as insulating gas. So let us understand like what's been used right now in the industry and why we can't use it any further. So for the SF6, the positive properties of SF6 are it's really inert, which means it doesn't react with metals or any other compounds that well. So it's really needed because we use it as an insulator. Then it has really good electric strength. So we have been using it from 1950s. So indeed it has been good. That's why we used it for almost 70 years. And it has a low normal boiling point, which is the reason why we can use it uh, for, the, for different applications, like places where the temperature is very low as well. So in the picture in the left hand side, what you can see is basically a GIS, which is air insulated. And in the right hand side, you can see the one which has SF6. So obviously the biggest difference is the size. So we went from a huge football field to something as small as inside a room. So that's, a, that's the biggest improvement we have had when we started using SF6. But suddenly, all of a sudden with the... Uh, one second, I'll just put it below. Yeah, uh, with the rising concern about the global warming, we see like it has always been there, but right now we started seeing like, okay, so SF6 has a huge global warming potential or the GWP and it's almost like 23,000 times more harmful than uh, HF, uh, 23,500 times more harmful than CO2 equivalent. And also what we see is the SF6 in the atmosphere versus the year, if we plot it, we see the amount of SF6 in parts per trillion has been rising at almost like a linear or even like a quadratic rate as well. So this is the point of concern because we have the Kyoto Protocol and then right now we have to really start phasing out SF6, which has already started. So for the beginning, how it started off was, yeah. So we started off with the preliminary screening of the SF6 alternative gases. So how did the screening happen? So we started off with a huge library. So it was almost 56,000 compounds. Uh, it was started, I think, two, three PhDs from ETH who were before I joined ETH and also many industries as well. So from Popkin, they had this huge library. So what they specified at the beginning was the molecular size had to be a maximum of 15 atoms. And also like the comp composition of these elements had to be between all these, which are stated here, like carbon, hydrogen, fluorine, and the rest. The main reason behind it was that the cost of production really had to be low. Like we can create something with like 300 atoms and stuff, but then if the cost is really high, then it defeats the purpose, right? Because we also have to look, keep that into our mind. The second one was the toxicity and the stability. So it really had to be non-toxic and it had to be st very stable as well in the operating temperature and pressure. The third one was the critical temperature. So the critical temperature should happen in the range of 300 Kelvin to 550 Kelvin as well. Then the flammability had to be really low because you're obviously using it for electrical purposes. So lower inflammability is one of the priorities as well. So the LFL had to be lesser than 0 0.1. And finally, 
the GWP that had to be also very low. So it had we like it was set to a value of almost 200. But then the gases that you see in the picture over here might not also fulfill like all the conditions, but this is like the best case scenarios that we came across, that we came up with. So in the left-hand side, you see the electric strength relative to SF6. So as a result, SF6 is relative to one with this SF6. And in the x-axis, you see the normal boiling point. So the higher you have the normal boiling point, the worse it is because you can't use it in the pure form or else you'll get like a liquid or something. So today we'll be discussing specifically on the ones which are right now the state of the art. So the natural gas mixtures of air, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide. Then we talk a bit about the freons, which is the CF3I, and this is also called HFO1234ZE. And we also talk about the fluorinated gases, the ketones and the nitriles. Also, what you see is you have other gases as well, like CF4, N2, but some of them are like they have either very high GWP or they're highly oxidating in nature, which means they can be inflammable or they have like high toxicity. So even if you have a good electric field strength, that really doesn't mean it's a good gas because everything has to be kept into mind. And for the C6F12, it's like very costly for production. So from that point of view, we really pointed down to this few gases in the end. So yeah, and also the, basically the references I've put in the end, so you can always look back, like what is the state of the art right now. So I'll first discuss about the current research, which is done at ETH for this SS6 alternatives, and then talk about today's agenda, like what we'll be discussing about. So we have something called the Pulse Townsend experiment. So the Pulse Townsend experiment basically takes all the Schwann parameters, which is the ion and the electron currents for the gases. So we are talking about pure gases here. Then we calculate the bulk uh, drift velocity, the longitudinal diffusion coefficients, the effective ionization rate coefficients. So this is done by uh, algorithmic method. After getting the input from the Pulse Townsend experiment, we have scientists who do like numerical and mathematical modeling of the gas physics, which is basically evaluation of the cross section of these pure gases. This is very much required for the fun understanding the fundamental physics behind the gases so that we can really model the uh, behavior of breakdown and discharges. Then we have the time lag experiment. So the time lag experiment basically extracts the statistical and the formative time lags. And then we also try to differentiate the different mechanisms like streamer or a streamer leader transition or arrested leader transition. In the right hand side, you can see the our setup. And yeah, in the end, we can also discuss about how we built up the setup. But the most important thing here is someone might not be familiar with the term statistical and formative. So what that basically is, so uh, in a GIS, if you have like a protrusion, then you start having partial discharges, right? And this partial discharges gradually grow, grow until it bridges the gap and has a breakdown. So as soon as you start applying the voltage to having the first partial discharge, that is referred to as a statistical time lag. So in the figure, you can see we applied the voltage and at this point, you started having like a discharge. So this time frame is called a statistical time lag. And from the first discharge until the breakdown, this is known as a formative time lag. So we can we simulate it and then we very validate with the experiments as well, which actually gives us a sense of like if we're going in the right direction or not. And today, our important topic of discussion would be the dielectric strength, the partial discharge and the material compatibility and the different defect experiments and its physics. Why? Because I've seen like it's really very interesting when we talk about like from an industrial perspective, because what the industry wants. So it's really interesting to know like what we are doing and how it's really applicable to the industry so that if you're looking for job or research, it's, it's really easy to go about that way as well. So our research was done in collaboration with the GIS manufacturers, which were ABB, General Electric, Siemens, and Hitachi. And the results that I got were directly used there as well. So also we had some research on the resistive plate chamber applications, which were specifically used in the hadron colliders at CERN. So coming to today's agenda, first we talk about two different categories. Like one is the regenerative gases. If you recall that uh, screening page, we had the CF3I and the HFO, and we have the, uh, so these are the non-regenerative gases. We'll understand what's the non-regenerative gas as well. And the other was the regenerative gases, which are specifically like the C4, C5, technical air, then all the natural origin gases like CO2, O2, N2, which generates normally. So 
then we try to see like what is the feasibility in the insulation application like can we use both the types or one type is a specific no go and the other is really better so we understand that then we answer the metallic defect detection in gis using this novel gases so the point over here is when we had sf6 we could easily detect like the uh, needle or like we could detect the gis protrusions basically but with these gases we don't know if we can detect it so if we have like a partial discharge and a breakdown instantly, then it doesn't make sense to have like uh, condition monitoring, right? Because you detect the partial discharge and you have the breakdown. So what is the point of doing the condition monitoring in such a system? So it's really essential to understand for these gases as well. And finally, and least, but it's 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 like the last but not the least, it's, it's very important as well because we have to know what's the compatibility with the metals. Like, does it really react with it? Because SF6, if we recall, it's inert. But for these ones, we, we have to really check. And also what is the solid byproduct deposition for this uh, SF6 alternatives. So we come back again to this slide and we answer the question in the end. So let us build up the story. So first we talk about the HFO or the non-regenerative gases. So it's it's also called the HFO one, two, three, four, ZDE. And this E is, you also have another variant, which is the Z, which are like basically positional isomers. And it has a formula C3H2F4. The best thing about this gas is it has a GWP of less than one. It has a very low liquefaction temperature of minus 19, and it's a really interesting candidate for the sun resistive plate chambers. So this part of the work is like what I'll be discussing today has been already there in our uh, recent uh, IEEE TDEI DEIS transaction. So you can also look that up for more in-depth analysis. So going by the properties of the gas, it really feels like it's a very perfect candidate, right? But let's let's delve deep into it further. So the research questions which arrive were like, can the HFO really reach the electrical capability of SF6 with respect to insulation characteristics in uniform AC field? So again, we are talking about AC field over here. And also the second point is we know that HFO is very sensitive to minute surface microtips. So it's really essential to understand the effect of the surface roughness. Uh, so that we can eliminate the surface characteristics for accurate measurements of the E by N measurements. And we'll understand what's, what's the E by N measurements. So for this, the experimental conditions where we varied the pressure from 0 0.45 to four bars, because beyond four bars, HFO started to liquefy at that temperature. Then we used an electrode gap distance of 4.88, 10, and 13.32. And the electrodes used were the uniform Rogowski electrodes. And the gases we used were, of course, pure HFO, but also we used CO2, and we'll see in the next slide why we need the CO2 in the first place. So all throughout the slides, you'll come across a lot of variables, so it's really essential to be clear in the first place. So P is pressure, T is temperature, KB is Boltzmann constant. N might be a new term, which is the gas molecule number density. It's basically a pressure divided by the Boltzmann constant or temperature, which is kind of a standardization. U is the applied voltage, D is the gap distance, is the field and E by N is basically, specifically the uh, number density reduced electric field. So you basically take the pressure and the temperature effect into the electric field calculation. And the unit is given in Townsend or TD. So coming to the experimental setup, I'll not go into the very details, but it was built up by me from scratch. And what we developed was the flange and the vessel design. So initially we thought of a very huge vessel, but then the gas handling and the gas filling would take like almost one and a half days. So we really went forward with like small flange designs and in SOLIDWORKS, we carried out the designs and finally what you have, we can do the gas handling in one single day and do like a whole set in a day. So yeah, that was the first thing. Then we developed the, uh, it was developed by a master student, the breakdown detection unit. So the breakdown detection unit has a really fast response time of less than 20 micro, um, less than 20 milliseconds, because we really did not want to damage the electrodes. Because if you wait longer, you have an arc, and then basically you damage the electrodes more, and the surface really plays an important role. Then, then we developed a PD sensor, which is a high frequency antenna. So for this setup, I made it like completely automated using Python. So it runs remote 24 seven. And in the right hand side, you can see like I have a bot, which basically gives me all the data about how it's running 
And if there's an error, it throws me an error and then I have to go there and intervene. So if you are building up an experiment, I think it's really nice if you think something in this line as well about making, making it autonomous so that you don't have to be in front of it when it's running. You can do your other simulations and stuff. And finally, we I have a pipeline where I do the post processing of the signal. So what happens is my experiment runs, I get the data using the Python script and then using AI and statistical methods, I directly do the peak detections and then I plot the graphs and do the analysis together. So if you're interested in building up like the experiment or talking about it, then after the end of the slides, we can definitely discuss about it as well. So coming to the research behind the HFO gas itself. So initially we tried to manufacture electrodes in all different ways, having different coatings and mineral polish. But what we always saw is we ended up with like when we did the surface profiling. So this graph basically represents the surface profile and the distance uh, which we measured. And these are the parameters according to the ISO standards. So we always saw like there were very minute micro tips always there, like no matter how good you do the finishing. So, and also in the parameters, you can see like this is one example, but some of them were like even 1.5, 2, 3. So you have something from like 0 0.5 to almost three micrometer tips. And these tips become really very uh, sensitive when you go to higher pressures. So that's why what we did was we really needed to eliminate the tips, right? So here comes the CO2 into picture. So what we did was we preconditioned our electrodes with initial shots, shots of CO2. Once we did it, what we saw was the first few shots in CO2 were really, very low. Why? Because again, you had those micro tips and those micro tips had like a field enhancement on the top and those field enhancement basically reduced the values. But we saw like after 20 to 30 shots, the values were super coherent. So you can really understand that maybe we got rid of the micro tips. Like you really can't quantify it, but we did it at least like 50 times. And we saw like after 20 to 30 shots, you really have like a very coherent value. And also from the surface profiling itself, you can see like the micro tips are almost gone. Like there are some you really can't eliminate, but then the effect is really, really, very really low once we do the preconditioning. So you have the, so how it goes is you have the mirror polish ones, then you do preconditioning in CO2, you measure it, and then we do the shots in HFO. So HFO seems to be a pretty good gas, right? Like low GWP, non-toxic, low normal boiling point, but it's a really ugly gas. Why? Let's let's have a look at the pictures B, C, and D. So once we had the shots at, so B is for 0 0.45 bar, which is really low. Then we did at one bar, at four bar, and also other pressures in the middle, but these are the important ones. Let's see into these. Like at low pressure, you have the low energy breakdown. So that's why for low energy, you still have small amount of carbonization, but then as the energy increases, you really have like ugly suiting in the uh, electrodes. You, and for four bar, you almost have like a pretty, pretty much dark electrode, like it's completely black. And in some cases, what you have is you also have the high voltage electrode bridging the grounded electrode. You almost have like this conductive channel of pure carbon suit forming between them. And then you can't ramp up the voltage and it's, it's like a perfect short circuit. And imagine using this in the GIS, like it's, it's a mess. So for me, when I did in the lab, I thought like maybe my in instruments were not working or something because I could never ramp up the voltage. But then when we opened the vessel, we saw like, okay, it's, it's this ugly conductive bridge which happens. So it's, it's a very stochastic process as well. You really can't say like, okay, every time it will happen, but it, it just happens suddenly. So coming into this, the peculiar thing is, if, let's consider HFO with CO2. If we consider breakdowns in CO2, you see like the values are super coherent. It's like almost from 28.5 to 30. It's, it's always within the range. And yeah, but for HFO at similar pressure, what we see is you always have a reducing trend. So it starts off at 73, it goes down to 64 and even lower. And why? It's, it's because of the suit and the decomposition products that you have. So in some papers you see like, there are like one or two papers on HFO as well. And they do kind of a, they do like 30 shots and they do a mean, but that absolutely doesn't make sense because if you have a reducing trend, then what does the mean suggest? What does the median suggest? It's nothing, it's bullshit. So only like for this regenerative gases, only your first shot is the true value. The rest of it really doesn't make sense. So if you want to have a statistics, you need to do the whole process like every time and just take the first shot. So no mean, no median over here. 
So it's it's a really peculiar gas because it has like this reducing trend. So now we come to the graph, which is like super important for this. So yeah, ah, before that, yeah, also for the HFO, like we did like the analysis of the solid decomposition products because for SF6 and all, we really didn't see any byproducts of fluorine, even though it has fluorine. But for HFO, you really had high de deposits of solid carbon, which you really expect, and also a high amount of fluorine near the crater surface as well. And solid fluorine is always kind of, if it reacts with hydrogen and if you have fluorine gases as well as solid fluorine and it, it forms HF, it's, it's really very harmful. So I'll not go into the details of each of the graphs, but what you can interpret is like there is high amount of solid fluorine as well near the craters. And finally, coming to the graph, I think I'll discuss this one first, which is super important. So the y-axis, which you see is the E by N BD, which is the number density reduced electric field in Townsend. And the x-axis is your number density multiplied by the gap distance. So yeah, here, so for all 99.5% of the gases that are there, you, you really don't see the, you don't really see a graph like this. And I'll, I'll explain you why. So I told I'll not get into mathematical formulas, but this one is like super essential. So if you see the mathematical expression over here, we have the E by N BD, which is this one equals to uh, E by N crit plus some value, right? So let us see what happens if we go on the right-hand side of the curve. If you go on the right-hand side, you see like five into 10 to the power 26, which is really high, right? So this denominator keeps increasing. So as a result, this value almost goes to zero because the denominator is very high. So my E by N BD is almost equal to an E by N crit. And this E by N crit for any other gas is a constant value. So if, even for 0 0.45 bar or one bar or 1.5 bar, you always see like for other gases, it settles down to a constant value. So maybe at 280 or something. But here you see like, so each of the solid lines represent like different pressures. So this is 0 0.45, this is one bar, this is 1.5, this is two. So each of them, if you see they saturated at like different values, like this one is not saturation, but if you consider like the topmost point and the bottommost point, it's like, yeah, almost a saturation. So they saturate at like always at different values for different pressure. So that's why this gave rise to a different paper from one other PhD colleague who did something on the properties of the HFO. And we figured out HFO exhibits something called a three-body attachment. And this three-body attachment basically leads to a reduction in the, uh, leads to a pressure dependency in the E by NBD. So that's why with different pressures, you have a different saturation. Also, the important thing what we see over here is uh, the maximum E by NBD is reached at three bar and the value is almost equal to 376 Townsend. This is important because we'll compare this with SF6 and see if, if it's close. And what you see in the dotted line is basically the streamer criterion. So the streamer criterion also shows like it's in good accordance with the experimental value. But the thing is we can only do the streamer criterion for 0 0.45 because the streamer criterion needs input from the Schwarm experiments and COMSOL simulation, but the Schwarm experiments can only go up to 0 0.5 bar. And the Schwarm experiments are one of a kind. It's only in ETH, so it's not that other places can go higher. In other places, you have a different kind of experiment, which is called a time of flight, but it's, it's a completely different mechanism altogether. So at least for swarm experiments, we could only go to 0.45. So that's why we could only do it for this one. For others, we can't validate because we don't have that data. So also about the three-body attachment, I'll not go into details, but if you're interested, we, I have a slide in the end and we can discuss it as well. Like what's the three-body attachment, but just for your Curiosity, I can say like, if you see the CO2 curve versus HFO curve, so that this curve is the rate coefficient, which you get from Schwarm parameters, and this is the reduced electric field. What you see is for CO2, like these are all the different pressures. So for all pressures, you have the same line because that's what it should be. But for this HFO with every different pressure, you, you see like the zero crossing is the most important here. So the zero crossing is different for every pressure. So that's why there's a pressure dependency. So once we found from this curve, like, okay, it's not saturating at a constant value, then we figured more into these ones and we figured out why it was happening. So it's really interesting. So it's not that it's a constant value, but it's really dependent on pressure. But again, you see like, it's not that you keep increasing the pressure, you keep getting higher values. It's more about you reach a highest value and then you started saturating. So it's also not that you keep getting like, I don't know, infinite values as well. 
So what are the conclusions? Okay, the so best part is pure HFO with preconditioned surface is observed to have similar or even better than SF6. So if you remember the last value, it was 376 Townsend. And for SF6, it's 358. So indeed, from electrical point of view, it's, it's much better, I would say. But the, quest, the biggest problem is it really cannot be considered in pure form for insulation in switch gear or switching applications. Why? Again, because you saw there was this black conductive powder and the bridge formations. And thirdly, preconditioning CO2 that we saw quantitatively improves the electrode surface and it also re reduces the microtips and the protrusions. And this modified methodology can now be applied to similar non-self-restoring gases as well. So now you see what is non-self-restoring. It's more like once you start with the gas and you have breakdowns, you start depositing carbon and then the, uh, uh, like the E by N value also reduces subsequently. So that means it cannot restore itself to the best of the insulation conditions. And hence, it's a non-self-restoring gas. Also, if you recall, I spoke also about CF3I. So I'll not go into the complete details about it, but CF3I is also such an ugly gas, you know, because here you don't have much carbonization, but it really forms like an oily layer on the electrode, as you can see over here. And that basically reacts with the electrode surface as well. Even for this one, you see with each consecutive uh, breakdowns, there's like a reduction in the strength. So you start off with 54 and you end somewhere in 40 as well. So this, so even like there's a paper which basically does the shots and say like, okay, so the mean value at this pressure is 40, but then it really doesn't make sense because you can't take a mean for these gases, like for the non-restoring gases. So the, the takeaway from the non-regenerative gases point of view is non-regenerative gases are really not the best choice for insulation. Like I didn't want to give a strong statement like you absolutely cannot use it or something. That's more for research, but like it's definitely not the best choice right at the moment. So before going to part two, if, if there's a question, we can definitely pick like a couple or something for two, three minutes. Or also, if you want, we can do all the questions together at the end. But if you have one or two questions, I'll be happy to take it up. Uh, hello, this is Balaji. I have a question. Yeah, perfect. Hey, Balaji. Uh, hi. Uh, so you told that the HFO gas, uh, mm -hmm. when you increase the pressure, the breakdown strength gets higher. I mean, sorry, the breakdown voltage is higher, right? Yeah, so of course. So my like... question, what? Yeah, with pressure, yeah, it's high. Yeah. So the point is, uh, I'm, I'm presuming you are lying in the left sa left hand side of the region of the uh, Passions Curve Valley. So uh -huh. uh, did you get to uh, did you get to estimate the passion curve from the uh, you know experiments that you're doing? And uh, no, so, uh, from so, that you will have the best choice of pressure versus gap distance. No, exactly. So we mainly do it in the right hand side after you have the passion minima because also if you have like a very small distance, it's it's like we have a very different kind of mechanism because for small distances we have like Townsend mechanism but we really wanted to keep it to streamer and leader because even from a practical point of view, uh, the companies are not really interested in uh, the Townsend mechanism because if you look into overhead conductors there, it's very important because you have very small gap distances a bit between the conductors and all. But for these kind of applications, we really look forward to uh, streamer mechanism and uh, leader mechanism, which is clearly towards the right and not towards the left. Okay, uh, fine. Thank you. That answers my question. And one yeah. more question, if I may. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, sure. in, in SF6, if you look at mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the effect of the breakdown, it would result in a VFTO, right? And that is associated with the, uh, that is associated with the topless time constant. So mm -hmm. in which case, uh, if you use a HFO or a CO2 uh, gas, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it will definitely alter the rise time of the uh, transient that is being generated as a result of breakdown. So mm -hmm. uh, have you had a chance to estimate the uh, the height of oscillations or the, the magnitude or the frequency of oscillations that arise as a result of the uh, breakdown in these gases? So, so thank you for the question. But firstly, like, are you talking about from insulation point of view or from switching point yeah. of view? Uh, from uh, switching. Because, uh, you know, BFTOs are generated when exactly. contact is breaking and exactly. uh, suppose even SF6 fails in the GIS. 
there's a protrusion or there's a metallic intrusion so that causes a uh, uh, you know um true, true, in, true. yeah so yeah, did I, you have a chance to explore that yeah uh, so our group specifically focuses on the insulation part but there's definitely the switching group which works on the like the transients and definitely if you're interested we can talk later and then i can follow up with my colleagues at eth who are working on the same and of course they have done the switching uh, part so they basically look after the transients and the oscillations for the system but ours is particularly the physics behind I'm it and, okay so, thank yeah. you yeah perfect okay yeah maybe we can also take up questions in the end and i'll just move forward and yeah in the end we can discuss it all together yeah so now so the from the first part it's pretty much clear that okay so the non regenerative ones are not the best choices so now we have yeah okay so now we come to the next part so here we talk so our screening from the screening gases it's getting even more smaller so can you feel the tension it's like will we be even left with something in the end so yeah let's go into the next part which are the generative like the regenerative gases so that's the c4f7n and the c5f10n so for the c4f7n it's commercially called the novec 4780 and that's produced by 3m the pros of the gas is it has dielectric strength of twice that of sf6 so pure c4 has a dielectric strength twice that of pure sf6 so just from this statement some of you might be like ah this is the perfect candidate right plus you have non toxic and non flammable like how better can it get but then it comes with the cons so the gwp is lower than sf6 but it's still high i would say because it's like almost 2400 but the biggest downside is it has a very high liquefaction temperature the liquefaction temperature is minus 4.7 so you really cannot use it in the pure form because if you go to a cold area for the gis application you basically have liquid so that has to be mixed with some other buffer gas and once you use the buffer gas the dielectric strength reduces so you can understand the uh, problem here right so you really can't use pure c4 uh, in direct applications the next one we'll discuss is the c5f10o so that's called the novec 5110 and that's also produced by 3m the pros are the dielectric strength is also twice that of pure sf6 it's non toxic non flammable plus you have a gwp of 1 like it's it's a perfect one right but then again the cons is the same it has a even higher liquefaction temperature of 27 degrees so you can't use it in pure form but again you have to mix with other buffer gases so this gives the overall physical overview or the physical properties and now we delve deep into the research questions which arise from it so also the biggest problem with these gases like the c4 and the c5 is as you can see it's a it's a relatively new gas because from 2016 alstom started researching so the long term decomposition products the toxic by products are, are really not known so it's it's a major issue because we just have like 6 years with ex expertise with the gas right now so this brings us to the second part of the agenda today so now i'll be discussing about the detection of the fixed metallic protrusions in acgis but we'll focus on the c4 f7 mixture because mostly the c4 is used for the high voltage gis and for the medium voltage they use c5 but then the c5 uses really really reducing so it's it's mostly the c4 being the state of the art right now so the aim of this contribution is to understand the insulation withstand level and the partial discharge detection levels in the sf6 alternative gases the difference here is previously you had the uniform field configuration but now since you have metallic protrusions you have a field enhancement so it's a strongly non uniform field configuration right now the second research topic is like understanding the effect of the addition of oxygen in the c4 co2 mixture because abb claim that the oxygen suppresses soot so it's really good from the switching point of view but in insulation does it really have a benefit like does it increase the insulation strength so it's it's really to be understood and also the focus is of this research was specifically on the fixed metallic protrusions on hv conductor in acgis because some of you might be wondering like ah okay then why didn't you research on the free metal particles or floating potential because those are there as well right but there's paper which really says like this is one of the most critical ones so 
if we can detect this one, then you can also detect the others in the gas. So it's kind of evaluating the worst case scenario, you know? So that's why we went forward with the fixed metallic protrusions in the GIS. So again, coming back to the experimental conditions. So we have a highly non-uniform field configuration and the geometry is in accordance with the Seagrave working group B1.67, which also originated from our lab under Krishna. So what does it say? So you have a sphere plane, which basically mimics that of a quasi-uniform field, plus you embed a needle in that sphere. So you have a highly non-uniform field. So the gas mixtures we used is mixture one, two, and three, which I'll refer from now on. So mixture one is a purely natural gas mixture. It's 85% CO2, 15% O2. The second one is the oxygenated C4 mixture. So you have 80% CO2, 15% O2, and 5% C4. And the third one is the one without the oxygen. So it's 95% CO2 and 5% C4. So some of you might be wondering like why this five? Because in the industry right now, the state of the art is using somewhere between four to six. So they don't mention the recipe like KFC doesn't say what they put in the chicken. So even there, they don't say what recipes they use, but they do say it's somewhere between four and six. So five is a good number, right? Yeah, so we did our experiments with five. The needle protrusion length has been varied from 1.5 to 10, which is there in the practical scenario. Like you can have something like a meter, but then if you have a meter protrusion in a GIS, then you might reconsider that GIS manufacturer, like taking something from him again. So that's why we took a really uh, practical case. The gap distance was also selected between 18 to 45, because if you have a very large or very small, as discussed by Balaji, uh, if, if I looked into that, it's like you have a different mechanism. So if you have a different physics mechanism, then everything becomes more difficult to interpret. So we tried to put like a uh, similar me reaction mechanism happening or similar gas physics happening. And the pressure has been selected from 1.5 to 6 bar, which is mostly used as well. So here I'll be using a lot of abbreviations as well, like the previous time. So L would mean the length of the needle protrusion in the GIS. P would be the distance from the needle tip to the grounded conductor. D is the distance between the sphere to the plane. R is the radius of curvature of the needle, which is mostly in micrometers. And the small p is the pressure. So keep in mind, it's a capital P and a small p. And also I'll use a lot of times something called FUF or the field utilization factor given by eta. So it's basically a ratio of the uh, electric field in a uniform field. So if, if you had like plane plane, it would be just U by the distance, right? So it's basically the E uniform field divided by the E max. And the E max is basically the maximum field which we would have near the tip of the needle because of the field enhancement. And to find this E max, we really needed to do some COMSOL simulations to find out the values. So before going to the simulations and the results, I really wanted to show this graph because if you recall the HFO graph, could you remember like the values kept going downwards? But for the regenerative gases, you see they're really very constant. So the red circles represent the CO2O2, the natural gas mixtures. The uh, diamonds represent the CO2O2C4 and the squares uh, and the blue square represents the CO2C4. So you can see it's the data really very coherent and you don't really see like a downward spiral or something. So these are what we call the regenerative gas. Now going to the COMSOL simulation. So what you see over here is the axisymmetric COMSOL simulation. So if you do a 3D of it, you basically get what I exactly have as my setup. So in the left-hand side, you see the potential distribution. And in the right-hand side, you see the uh, electric field distribution. So also like this is, so as I discussed before, you have the sphere, then you have a needle embedded inside, and then you have the grounded electrode. And this needle is basically shown over here. And as you can expect, you have the maximum field announcement at the needle tip. So here, if you recall from the last slide, we have two variables, like of course pressure is variable, but then you can vary the needle length. So the protrusion can vary and the gap distance can vary or the distance of the protrusion from the ground electrode. So coming to the first case, what we do is we vary the protrusion length. So the protrusion length, as you can see, is varying, but the electrode distance is constant. So keeping one constant helps us to analyze one scenario. And then in the next case, we vary the other two. So as you can see, as our uh, protrusion length increases, it becomes more non-uniform and the FUF basically reduces. So lesser is the FUF, more is non-uniform is your geometry. So for uniform geometry, FUF is one. 
for the worst case scenario, it's it's it should be like theoretically zero. So you see, this is reducing. I'll explain just one graph and the rest of the color coding is the same and we directly go into the conclusions because that's more important. Maybe you can look back at the slides later to analyze it more, but right now let's see what each of them represents. So this one is for the first case, this one is for the second case, and this one is for the third case. That's clear. Then what we do is the, in the x-axis, we vary the pressure from 1.5 to 6, as I said before. And in the y-axis, you have the measured voltage. So all the same colors correspond to the same mixture. So for uh, the blue one corresponds to the C4 CO2 mixture. The orange one corresponds to the CO2 O2 C4 mixture. And the red one corresponds to the CO2 O2 mixture. The solid lines represent the breakdown voltage, as you can see. So these are the breakdown voltages in the three mixtures. The dotted ones for each of them are the PDIV or the PD inception voltage. And the dash lines are the PDEV or the PD extinction voltage. So what is the PDIV and the PDEV? So PDIV is basically you start increasing the voltage and at one point you start seeing PD activities, right? So the point where you have like a repetition rate of at least five, like I set a value and if you have that repetition rate, then you say your PD has incepted. Then we increase the voltage about 10% more. We keep it for some time and then we reduce it. And the point where you see absolutely no PD is your PD extinction voltage. Why is this important? Because in some gases, you have a really large difference between the inception and the extinction. And there you have to really investigate what physics is going on. But good for us, what we see is the PD inception and the extinction were very close to each other and almost very similar. So we didn't really go into the in-depth details as to like why they're not different. So yeah, so this was one case. And what you see over here is basically the ratio between the BDV and the PDIV. So why is that important? So higher is the ratio, easier it is for us to detect. So it's like if you have a PDIV at 40 kilovolts and if you have a breakdown at 42, then absolutely no use because you have the PDIV, you have the breakdown. But if you have a PDIV of 40 and you have a breakdown of 80, that's really nice because you have quite a substantial difference. So that's why higher is the ratio, better is the uh, ease to detect the defects. Also, we'll discuss why you have that this kind of a hump, but why not in this one? Just one thing to like one food for thought would be like, you see this appears at the lowest FUF, but for the other FUFs, you really don't see it. So maybe that has a correlation with FUF. We, we discuss it in the next slide. And the second one is now we vary the electrode distance, but we keep the protrusion length constant. So you see the protrusion length is same, but we vary the distance. So here you see that the FUFs are much lower than this one itself, and it reaches as low as 0 0.01. So for the lowest FUFs, you see this hump always appears. So we'll, we'll discuss about this in the next one, all the conclusions. So the color code is the same and everything is the same maintained in the graphs, also the ratio one. One thing you notice is of course the natural gas mixtures is much lower than the other two. And yeah, we, we discussed this in the conclusion itself, like what, what we concluded. So just to summarize, because it's a lot of information, what you have is you either vary the protrusion length or you either vary the distance. Accordingly, you get the PDV, the PDIV, and the PDEV curves. Then you do the ratio between them to obtain it. So yeah. So coming to the conclusions, the first one is pretty obvious and it was known even before the experiment, trust me. So for the natural gas mixture one, the BDV, the PDIV, and the PDEV are significantly lower than mixtures two and three, which are expected. So the new findings are for all the pressures between 1.5 to 6 and for the distances of 18 and 25, we see the ratio is close to 1.5 and 2, which is pretty good, I would say. But as the D increases to 45 millimeters, the ratio becomes very high. It goes to 5. So like basically finding the protrusion at such a high ratio is really easy than at the lower ones, right? But what we see is for increase in L from 1.5 to 10 millimeters, which is a practical case, of course, the ratio always remains between 1.5 to 2. So what do we take away from it? it? It means that the ratio becomes significantly more when we increase the D. So when your HV conductor is away from the grounded conductor, it's easier to detect than when you have a large protrusion. And also, if you have a very large protrusion, you can visually see it as well. So that's not an issue at all. The second one is for mixtures two and three, the ratio increases. The ratio between the BDV and the PDIV increases from 1.5 to 3 bar, 
and then it reduces from three bar to six bar. So why is this increment? So what I mean is like here, if you take the ratio, it's much higher over here, you see, because of this hump. So here, the ratio is much higher. And the reason behind it is you have something known as the corona stabilization effect, which happens around three bar. And also I have a slide in the end. So if you're interested, we can discuss the physics as well, what happens during this corona stabilization effect. And this corona stabilization, as we keep increasing the pressure, it, it ceases to act. So that's why you have like the reduction again. So this hump was mainly because of the corona stabilization happening at highly non-uniform uh, values of FUF. The other important one was like, did oxygen really have an effect in insulation? Because it was really good for switching. But for insulation, we see it did not improve the BDV at all. Because if you see it's like, let's check this one. Like they're very similar. If you see they're almost one on top of the other. So the oxygen does not improve the BDV, but what we see is the PDIV and the PDEV reduces. As a result, the ratio between them is increased. And if the ratio is higher, that means you can easily detect that effect. So in that perspective, it's really nice. The most important other factor is how does it compare to SF6? So when you compare it to SF6, the ratio in this mixture is one, two, and three are almost 2.5 times higher. And for low pressure, uh, for the low pressure, it's almost like 2.5 times higher. And for the high pressures, it's like 1.5 1, 1. times higher than SF6. So in the past, if you could detect an SF6 and do condition monitoring, then for sure, you can also do this for these cases as well, for the C4, F7 mixtures as well. So there's easy detection in the natural origin and C4, F7 mixture gases as well. But again, if you ask me like what happens if you have like a huge uh, defect or like, I don't know, very... Uh, the distance is very small and you have Townsend, then of course those are like, you know, edge cases. We have to really do case by case then like what happens for those. But for the normal range, which is there in the practical scenario and also the industry wanted us to investigate, you, you see this. And finally, the insulation monitoring for PD activity at medium pressure of three bar is, is very promising because you could see that hump, so the ratio was higher. But for higher pressure, it is possible, but a bit more difficult because the ratio is lower. So yeah, so this brings us to the end of the GIS one. So definitely what we, just to wrap up, it's like, it's better than SF6 for detecting the metallic particles. And once you can detect the metallic part, like you can detect the metallic protrusions, it's easy for the floating particles and all to be detected as well. And it's, it's easy to do the analysis for three bar. So it was really a good takeaway. And also from an industry point of view, they were also quite eager to know this. This brings us to the end, like the last part of the research, which is the uh, work function. Like it's not the most important one, but it's definitely very important in the sense like for ages, we know air doesn't react with any of the part, like the metal or anything. It's, it's really inert, but for these gases, we know it reacts, but it's not really known like with which metals. So we just talk about the most important ones, which are being used. So this paper is still under preparation. So yeah, the conclusions and all, I'm still making it. So, yeah. Uh, the first point of my research was this, this material. Yeah. Yeah, again, Balaji. So yeah. there's one question that's been bothering me. Uh, okay, so perfect, you say, uh, uh, So you say that you have compared SF6 and uh, C4, F7. Yeah. But yeah. the question is, uh, in, G in a GIS system, never mm -hmm. is SF6, uh, you know, uh, static it is always flowing right and that yeah, is what yeah. removes the uh, charges that are generated due to the mm -hmm. result of off field discharge activity or uh, high field at the uh, mm -hmm. at the tip of protrusions so mm -hmm. um, when you have c4 f7 uh, you know c4 uh, mm -hmm. uh, that gas flowing mm -hmm. yeah mechanism of breakdown or uh, produce, uh, you know, maybe different results than it would under a static case? So firstly, we, we also have flow because we have like, I installed a fan. So the flow rate is always there. And also okay. this is, so that is one thing. And also this is very critical for DC because in DC you really need to blow, like uh, uh, blow the charge carriers as well, because uh, if, if you're yeah. considering between, We'll yeah, have between, space as close to the electrodes accumulated exactly. uh, over a Ex period of time. Exactly. So, so what we do is here we do a waiting, like this was for AC, but when we did DC, what we do is 
uh, we have a waiting time and also we basically flush it with the opposite charge so that you don't have the space charge accumulation. So that is something we do there as well. Okay, something like polarity reversal. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Polarity okay. reversal, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Yeah, so, so for this one, we see the effect of the walk function for C4, C5 and technical air mixtures with CO2 and O2, which are the buffer gases, but for high electric field of 20 to 42 megavolt per meter. And we'll see why high electric field. So, yeah, as I said, like the first question that appeared to me is, was does material compatibility really play a role for novic gases? And in the literature, it says above 20 megavolt per meter field, the breakdown is dominated by cathode emission for certain gases. So they did some analysis for different molecule gases in the past, like we are talking about like 2000 and 1990s. And they saw like at very high fields, there was some kind of a cathode a work function playing a role because in normal low lower fields you have the gas physics dominating so it's a gas property so for all the materials you would have like very similar values but at very high fields you see different uh, cathode emissions occurring so it's it was really interesting for me to investigate like the effect of the work function on yeah effect of the work function basically so again coming to the experimental conditions i chose a single gap distance of five millimeters uniform with a 60 millimeter diameter electrode. So what we used is we didn't use any external UV radiation because UV would be the source of uh, your starting electrons. So what instead we did was we did a very slow ramp and yeah, instead of using like a UV radiation. And accordingly with the geometry that we have, we ended up with a 20 to 42 megavolt per meter, which was exactly what we wanted. The electrode material which we used was brass, copper, titanium, stainless steel, and aluminum. Right off the mind, I, I don't remember like which exact uh, like values of copper, lead we use, but it's like, these are the materials. If you want, I can give in details like which was the exact uh, DIN standard we use for them. And we use this because this is major, majorly used in the industries as well, like not titanium, but the others. The titanium was interesting because in the past literature, someone used it and saw some interesting results. And trust me, it's cheap. It's, it's not that costly, like titanium, yeah. So the gases we investigated was, again, 5%. Why? Because it's according to the industry standards. So C5, 5%, 80% CO2, 15% O2. Then 5% C4, 80% CO2, 15% O2. And technical air, which is 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. So I'll do it really fast. So over here, what you see is in the left-hand side, the breakdown voltages. And in the right-hand side, the E by N crit values. So the first five corresponds to the first five materials in C5. The next one are the five materials in C4. And the next one is the materials in synthetic air or technical air, so 80% into 20% O2. So as you can see from the first thing, what you see is obviously air is much lesser than this two, which we also said in the previous one. And there's a lot of literature as well on that. But what we see is the beat breakdown voltage of C5 mixture is almost equal to a slightly higher than C4, which is also expected. And that is much higher than synthetic air. For synthetic air, like, of course, in the literature, a lot of work has been done. So you see almost similar values for synthetic air as well, because synthetic air is inert. So it really doesn't react with the cathode materials. And also I did my streamer criteria numerical computation, and we saw like, the computation came up to 140 Townsend, which is absolutely what we got from experimental results as well. So this is a good validation that our experimental setup is good. Now, the interesting thing is for C4, we see that the, so for C4, we see the aluminum stain, like aluminum and stainless steel are higher than the other three. Why? Because we could really see like a reaction happening with these electrodes, which we couldn't see with this one. And for C5, for titanium, stainless steel, and aluminum, we didn't see a reaction, but there was quite some reaction with brass and copper. So if we see the electrodes from a visual inspection, we'll see it better as well. So I'll not go into each of them, but the first one is for synthetic air. This is for C4, this is for C5, and these are the materials. So for air, you see it's just like craters. So you have small carbonization, you have craters, and yeah, no reaction, perfect material, you know, perfect insulation. For C4, let's let's take like copper, for example, you see there's kind of like a foggy mist. So it's like a really bad reaction happening with copper. Even if you look at titanium, there's like quite some amount of reaction as well. But for stainless steel and aluminum, you see these are like similar. It's like just you have craters and you have carbon. Even for C5, you see 
some amount of mist happening. So indeed, with some of the specific metals, it, it does react a lot, like this C4 and C5, which is not there for synthetic air. So seeing under a microscope, what I saw was, I just gave a few examples. It's like with brass, titanium, and copper, you see like around the crater area, it's like really ugly. It's like you have some reactions which give rise to different solid deposits and hence the different colors, as you can see. This is like oxidation and all. But if you consider uh, like the others, like synthetic air or aluminum with C4, you see just the crater and there's not much reaction as well. So this is, this is really, nice that these doesn't react so much as that one because it's very important from a GIS point of view. But I'll just recap really fast. So we studied the non-regenerative and the regenerative gas. From the feasibility, definitely HFO does exhibit better insulation than SF6, but then it shows the three-body attachment as well. But the non-regenerative gas mixtures are really not suitable for insulation or switching because they have suit formation, which can lead to short circuit. For metallic defects, like metallic defects on HV conductors is easier to de detect in C4 or natural gas than SF6 up to six bar. The addition of oxygen from an insulation point of view really doesn't make a difference, but it makes the detection of this uh, metallic protrusions easier. And finally, with the compatibility, we see technical air is really nice, but for C4 and C5, it does react with some of them. So yeah. So this slide should have been in the beginning, but I really put it in the end just to give the whole picture. Like in 1920s, we started with oil as the insulation medium. Then we went to Freon in 1936. In 1950s, we went to SF6 and we made some patented technologies like we as in the industry. Then from 57 to 61, there was really some work on compressed air. Then for 50 years, we were really happy with SF6 and compressed air some parts as well. But in 2014, we started going towards the GQ because of this Kyoto protocol and the SF6 problem. But now, one month back, the biggest news comes that 3M uh, decided to exit the PFAS manufacturing by end of 2025, which means no C4, no C5, no Freons. So what's the end scenario? We come back to compressed air. So all these years of research from all different institutes, it's kind of like it gave us a lot of direction, but then we again come back to compressed air because 3M has stopped manufacturing. So I don't really know if it's a political thing or it, they define some toxicity. It's, it's of, of course up to them to tell us like what's, what's the issue. But then right now, till February, I think from the whole industry is really going towards compressed air. And also at Prismian, we use compressed air and we never went towards uh, the ketone on nitrile as well. So yeah, the last slide, so we also do a lot on thermochemistry. So if you're interested to discuss about transition state, decomposition gaseous products, we couldn't do it because of the crunch of time. We do mechanism of gaseous discharge classification. And I also use a lot of AI tools to differentiate like leader, streamer, then uh, peak detection and other for like all kinds of simulations as well. So if you're interested, like I'm very open to discuss about them as well. So yeah, questions if you had before we end. And thank you so much. It's like one hour is really a long time for having, you know, the same amount of concentration. So I really, really appreciate everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you, Devan, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, I would encourage all the participants to unmute themselves and ask uh, questions. And if they are unable to unmute, you can post the questions in the chat box. Uh, hello, Deva and Balaji here again. Yeah, hey, Balaji. Sure. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, all these gases that you've been experimenting with are mm -hmm. mostly noble. But the whole purpose of using SF6 in GIS mm -hmm. is for its mm -hmm. electronegativity rather than mm -hmm. you know using uh, N2, which is probably noble, right? So wouldn't you prefer a more electronegative gas for a GIS application because of its arc quenching nature inherent arc quenching nature because it's able to absorb electrons right when you have uh, you know streamers propagating rather than using noble gases which uh, you know may be bulkier but then you know they sort of try to get in the path of electrons so uh, wouldn't you develop more electronegative gases than noble gases that's the quick question there. yeah for sure like nitrogen you, you took a very i would say like a Bad example. Very one of, 
one of a kind example because it's non attaching so if, if you look at the attachment rate of nitrogen uh, mm -hmm. into is into as an attachment rate of zero so by principle you can never use like pure nitrogen so that's why the whole purpose of technical air is to put oxygen so that you put some attachment factor into mm -hmm. it so mm -hmm. sf6 of course it's as you said like it's it's really one of the perfect choices and that's why you use it but right now the whole point is it's it's more you know environmental and political than research because it's it's about it, it it has a very high gwp so we really need to change it so that's why we went towards the c4 and the c5 which had like similar properties as that as well but again we see like 3m found some i don't know maybe toxicity or i don't know they want to eradicate the whole thing at once like the fluorinated gases so that's why we come to technical air so for sure you can't use 100% nitrogen because that's like non attaching so you have a alpha minus eta equals to zero so yeah but that's why you put oxygen but yeah your point is absolutely valid yeah okay hey, there we um, are. Uh, ways here hey um, ways. <laughs> hey um so thanks for this wonderful presentation uh it gave a lot of information uh well i have this question regarding to hfo uh it all HFO created uh, some suiting effect uh, after breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in the case of uh, C4, we add oxygen in order to eliminate the suiting effect, right? Mm -hmm. So is there a mixture or can we mix HFO with, let's say, oxygen in order to eliminate this effect of suiting or uh, is, it a, uh, is it something stupid? No, very good question, but it's like, I can give you the setup and, but the only downside is it's flammable. So you can do it, but then HFO with oxygen, it's, it's highly flammable. So okay. I'm very open. Like, yeah, if you're willing to do the experiment, then I can take the results from it, like, honestly, but it, that's, a, that's the whole point. Like, it's, it's a very good question, but the only issue is like, if you put oxygen with HFO, then yeah, the, so it's, it's made by Climber Life, I think the, and the company really says not to use oxygen and HFO. So that's like a no-go kind of a thing. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Any more questions from the participants? I would request I would request all the participants to please uh, switch on their video so that we can take a group photo in form of a screenshot. Uh, Divine, I think you can stop sharing the screen now. Exactly, that was what I was seeing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Devan, once again, uh, to be on board as speaker for the event. And in this regards, I would, I would ask you to accept a virtual token of appreciation on behalf of IEEE DIS student branch chapter IIT Kanpur. Thank you so much. But you guys are doing like a wonderful work because if I could go back, I would start something where I studied as well, because honestly, like bringing this in for master's PhD and everyone, I think it's a really good exposure. And I'm also looking forward to the future sessions with other speakers so that I can have a good discussion as well. So, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, Devan, could you post your LinkedIn ID uh, in the chat box so that the participants can connect with you after the session also? So this is my office laptop. So I, I can't access it right now. Okay, but... okay. I'll ask. Uh, can I ask any of the members from the team to please post the LinkedIn ID of Devayan in the chat box? Yeah, that should be perfect. Thank you yeah. so much. 
so with this uh, i would end the webinar of january edition 2023 i would like to acknowledge the efforts of the entire ieee dis sbc team at iit kanpur for planning and executing a wonderful webinar i also express ex express my sincere gratitude to ieee iit kanpur student branch and ieee up section for their support i would also acknowledge dr alok ranjan verma our branch chapter advisor and dr nandini gupta our mentor for providing their valuable guidance and support no event is complete with a lovely audience we thank you all for being with us it was a great pleasure thank you very much uh, participants who have not filled the feedback form can do so it is available in the chat box if any one of you have missed it please fill it up and the linkedin id of the speaker uh, is available in the chat box perfect thank you thank you once again participants okay. and speaker yeah thank you so much and yeah have a nice day and i'll yeah, see you, you too. later catch up yeah